Okay, hi, uh, my name is Derek and I'm your instructor for our machine learning um, and um, uh, uh, data science class. Um, although, uh, for these videos, I might use these for some other classes as well. So the, the video that we're going to be looking at today is just a, it's going to be a relatively quick uh, introduction to the basics of Python programming. So I, I probably have two videos here, uh, and the other video I'll go into some of the more um, advanced features of Python, okay? But I just want to go through kind of the basics, all right? So in this course, you do need to know, you need to pick up Python. You don't have to become an expert in it. Um, I mean, you know, I am expecting that um, you. Let's see here, let's get the, the. So I'm looking at the one in Python stack called uh, Python Programming Functions and Control Structures here today. Okay. So as I was saying, so for this class, we are using Python. Um, I, I don't expect that that you maybe have, you know program Python. Um, before in this class, but I do expect that you know some programming, so that, that you've programmed in a language and you kind of know what how to write a function in some language and how to how to write uh, basic control structures of the language, you know, like like loops, for for loops, while loops, um, uh, conditional statements, if else. So my basic goal here today is just to go through kind of the basics of those things in Python. So functions and some control structures and things. Just to look at the syntax and maybe discuss a few things, all right? So most of these examples are stuff I have from my own previous lecture notebooks and also from the first seven or so chapters of the Think Python book, which is the one I mostly recommend. I, I think if you just, if you've never program with Python before, if you just spend, you know, half a day or an hour or two with this book, that's a good one. I have some other resources, you know, videos and things, but but this, if you're looking for a textbook, this is a good one. I like it because it's not only Python, but there's also some kind of higher level stuff about computer science uh, and debugging and, and writing programs and stuff in general. So, so Python is, is a very, um, I mean, I use Python a lot. Okay, it's my go-to language for lots of different tasks: um, machine learning, data analytics, um, uh, scripting, automating stuff. So, so um, it's becoming very popular in in lots of different areas. Okay, so um, so I'm just gonna rerun all of these. Um, So, uh, yeah, we don't need that. But so, as most basic, so, so we start with you know kind of a hello world. So, so a bit, one of the built-in commands is the print function. That, that's a built-in function. So, you know, so we can generate output to a terminal just by invoking this function. Okay, but but this is an example of a function. So again, I, I expect you you have written functions and used functions in other languages. Um, so the syntax here is pretty similar to, you know, Java and C um, and many other languages. So if you want to invoke a function, you use parentheses and then you give it some things in, be in between the parentheses. So you pass in some arguments, all right? So that's our first example of a function. Um, and like I said, I'm going to go pretty quickly through this uh, because, for example, I expect that, that in... That if you have done some programming, you you know you know some of the basics, and, and most of the stuff is pretty similar to C or Java, so all the operators are there: plus, minus, uh, star for multiplication, slash for doing division, right? Um, so I will mention one thing. So so this is relatively new to Python, but by default, the, the single slash operator performs floating point division, right? Now, in like some languages like like C, if you do a slash, it will by default will do um, integer division. So you might sometimes not get what you're expecting if you if you do like a slash and you just use integers on both sides. Okay, uh, on Python you can use a double slash to force integer division. Okay, so so even though the result of this is a um, you know is, is a real value number, a number with a decimal point. Um, if, if you really do want integer division, um, you can use the double slash, and that'll give you integer division. All right. So that's a, a, a kind of a new thing in Python three. Python three is not that new, but but it's relatively new. Okay. So. Um, and there are other operators. Um, so we'll use the raising things to a power or exponentiation a lot. 
So 6 squared plus 6 should be um, 42, right? Um, be careful. So some languages do use the caret to raise, to, to mean raising to an exponent. But in Python, as well as like in C, uh, that is actually an XOR operation. So if you're expecting exponentiation, you won't get um, what you're expecting there. So you do have to use that double star if you want to raise things to a power. Uh, you should, I mean, again, I'm assuming that you know what we mean by order of operators and what operator precedence means, okay? So the, the usual order of operators applies in Python, um, so, so, you know, you might have um, um, heard of, like, PEMDAS, um, uh, so parentheses before exponential, uh, exponentials before... Um, multiplication and division before addition or subtraction, right? So different areas have slightly different acronyms for those things, right? So that all applies, but you can always, of course, also use parentheses as with most of the languages that Python is has overlap with um, in order to force a particular order of precedence, right? And you can combine many operators to get complex mathematical expressions, um, you know, like, like an example like this here, all right? Okay. So Python is an interpreted language as opposed to a, a compiled language, which, um, you know, I probably should have mentioned before this point, but the reason why I'm able to run a notebook like this is because whenever I hit uh, Shift-Enter, in this case, for my Jupyter Notebook, it actually sends that line or these lines of code to the interpreter and I immediately get back the results. So that's different from a compiled language where I would have to take the whole language, compile it to an executable, and then run the executable. Okay, So, so I can interpret line or, or a few lines at a time using the Python interpreter. Right? But even though Python is an interpreted language, underneath it, it's still using um, um, types, data types uh, for the language, which, again, I'm assuming you're probably familiar with, with the basics of this, all right? Although uh, Python is a dynamically typed language, all right? So uh, just some examples should make that clearer. Um, so all constants that you might use are going to be represented by some data type. So, so, so there has to be some data type behind the scenes that, that Python will use to represent things like, like a number two, okay? And these data types have a lot of overlap with C and Java, the data types that I'm, I'm assuming most people are, are familiar with, okay? So whole numbers like this would be represented by integers uh, by the Python language. Uh, numbers with decimal points in them are going to be represented by floats or double types, right? Uh, there is a built-in string type in Python, okay? So, so if you're used to C... Um, uh, you might have, but like Java or C++ have a built-in string, or mostly a built-in string type, and, and, and Python has a built-in string type. So str represents the built-in string type. There's a built-in Boolean type uh, for true and false values. Okay? There's, there's actually a built-in complex type um, for complex numbers. And we'll see later on some examples some, of some other data structures. That, that are kind of higher level containers that are kind of really, you can think of as built into the Python language. So. Um, okay, so I've got some self tip exercises. I mean, you should really should work through this notebook of your, yourself and, and try and answer these self -tef test exercises that I give to you to make certain that you understand the things that we're going through, okay? So, as with most procedural uh, languages that you're probably again, that I'm assuming that you're familiar with, even though you may not have done Python, you've probably done some kind of programming in a, in a language that, that, that supports procedural programming. So in those types of languages, you can define variables and you can assign values to variables. That's kind of one of the basic things of a function. So here we're doing that. So the, the assignment state in, in, um, in, in like a typed language like C, you would have had to declare the variable first the, the variable before you could have actually used it and assigned it to a value. It, in Python, which is dynamically typed, whenever you just do an assignment statement, it will figure out kind of 
you know, from, from the constant or from what you're assigning into it, what the type of that variable is. So in this case, it creates a string variable called message and assigns the string into it. It, it, it creates an integer variable called in um, and assigns the integer, uh, the value 17 into it, and, create, and it creates a, a floating point value and assigns the float into it, okay? So um, I didn't show here, but um, um, kind of like I did up above here, you know, we could have found the types of those. So we could ask what the type of message is. It should be a string type um, or what the type of pi is um, and so on. It should be a float type, right? Um, so... The, the, the rules for how you can, the, the names that you can use for variables is going to be the same as in languages like C and Java, pretty much the same that you're used to, okay, so, so variable names have to start with like a, a letter or an underscore, they can't start with a, a, a digit, a number, um, but they can have underscores, upper or lowercase letters or um, numbers uh, in the names, okay. So, so these are all legal examples of legal names. Um, you know, so this isn't legal because you can't start with a number. Um, this isn't legal because you can only the only character besides letters and numbers that you can use is the underscore. So you can't use at uh, in names for variables. Um, and this one is it looks pretty legal, except class is a um, reserved word in Python. You can see the list of the Python keywords if you click on uh, here. There's not a whole lot of them. There's only about you know, 40, 50, or 60 there, right? Um, but yeah, if you ever type in a keyword, you'll see that the highlighter, if you're using Jupyter Notebook or, or a good editor, the highlighter will, you know, will catch it as a, as a keyword. So that'll be another indication that, that you can't use that. Um, so an expression is just a combination of values and variables and operators. So a value by itself is an expression, or a variable by itself is an expression. Uh, assignments are not expressions, those are statements. So when I assign some values into variables, I'm, 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 I'm declaring a statement that gets executed by the Python interpreter. Um, so, so a statement is a unit of code that has an effect. So in this case, it has the effect of, of causing an assignment um, to be assigned to a variable. Um, and in this case, it has the effect of, 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 of defining an expression that when we evaluate it, evaluates to some particular number. All right. So I'm sorry, the, yeah, I mean, this is the second one is an expression, right? So, so that when you evaluate it, it evaluates to a number. Okay, so I first wanted to talk about functions before I look at um, um, uh, control structures like condition statements and loops and stuff, okay? So it's a little bit backwards from the, maybe the usual presentation when you're first learning a language or definitely when you're first learning to program, but, but functions to me are fundamental to being a, a, a good programmer and to understanding how to program, okay? So a function is just a name sequence of statements that performs a computation. Um, so we've already used several functions in this notebook. So when we called print or when we called type, those were examples of some built-in functions. So, so this is how you invoke a function in Python, the same, as you, the same way you invoke functions in C and Java. So you have to know the name of the function to invoke it, and you have to know what parameters it takes as input, and you give the, the parameters in, in between between uh, regular parentheses, all right? So both of these functions only take one parameter or one um, attribute as uh, input here, or sorry, as one argument as input, okay? Um, here's some more built-in functions. Uh, I think somewhere I have, yeah, a link to, to, to a lot more of the Python built-in functions, so it would be good to look at kind of the built-in functions. Uh, if you want to convert things from strings into fundamental types, there's functions for doing that. Um, although these conversion functions will throw an exception uh, if, if it doesn't, if it can't figure out how to convert it into that type, okay? So <coughs> normally for these notebooks, um, I want my notebooks to run cleanly all the way from the top to the bottom, 
So anytime I have an example of code that's going to throw an exempt exception that would cause the notebook to stop at that point, I usually put it in a try except block. Okay. So anyway, if you if you want to, you, you can do the raw thing here by, by just doing the statement. Right. So if, if you try and convert something into an integer and it can't figure out how to do it, you'll get a value error in that case thrown for you. All right. um, float converts things into floats and so on. All right. uh, there's lots of built-in functions. Um, here's one that's useful. If you do a directory, this actually uses what's known as introspection. So um, Python, because it's, it's a dynamically typed language and a dynamic language, we can actually do things like, like um, uh, introspect. So we can figure out, for example, what things are currently defined in my namespace. So the variables that I've created so far, like in and pi and radius, um, we can see are in my namespace, plus a bunch of other stuff. Uh, here's another fun here's a function that takes two parameters. Um, it takes uh, uh, two numbers to divide. And divmod, instead of just returning either the uh, divisor or the remainder, I'm sorry, the, the, the quotient or the remainder, uh, returns both of those at the same time. So in this case, when you divide these two numbers, the result is six with a remainder of two. Right? So it returns actually two results here. We'll talk about that later here. Um, So there are many, many other functions besides the built-in functions, um, but all the other functions are going to be in what are known as libraries or modules. So in Python, these are normally called Python modules. So if you want to use a function that's in um, a module, like the math module, we can do an import statement. So whenever you import, this imports all of the functions and other stuff, like constants and, and other thing, classes and things that are defined in the math module I just imported. But Python has the the concept of namespaces. Again, high-level languages like C++ and Java, you might be familiar with this concept. Hopefully you are familiar with that. So when you import math, all these functions are still in the math namespace, OK? So if I do a directory on the math namespace, you can get a, a list of kind of the functions. So math has functions for trigonometric functions like sines and cosines and logarithmic functions and exponential functions. It has some things that aren't functions, like it has some defined constants like pi and uh, e, and I think there's one or two others. Okay. So yeah, so, so some of the things here aren't actually functions like pi, so that's just the value of pi to um, all the significant digits that can be supported by a floating point number and, and e is another useful mathematical constant. So, so notice how we access things in a namespace. We use this dot operator, this dot notation. So anytime you have something that, that's a member of a namespace or a member of a class or an object, if, if we want to access th that item, whether it's a constant or a, a method or a function, that's in that namespace. We use the namespace dot, and then the thing we're trying to access that's in that namespace. All right. Um, so those were some constants for the math. Um, let's um, let's use some examples of some variables from our math module, so we can get the the log base ten by using the log ten function from math. So here to calculate the signal to noise ratio in decibels of, of two values. You can calculate sines and cosines and tangents and arc cosines and all that kind of things using functions from math. Uh, all these functions are expecting radians instead of degrees, so we first have to, to either have it represented as radians or convert the things from degrees into radians. So, um, All right. Um, so it's it's possible to have the, the the whole purpose of this section composition is just to show the example that whenever you can have more complex expressions. So whenever you want to pass in um, 
a parameter to a function. So in this case, like the sign um, and and the um, the log function, they only took one parameter. So only only passed in one thing. Uh, and again, the, the sign the sign function only takes one parameter, but you know you can pass in an expression. So if you do something like this, compose an expression, the expression will first be evaluated. So it will first you know find out what the value of degrees is and, and use the order of precedence here. So, so, um, so since, since, since division and multiplication have the same precedence, um, it'll just evaluate these from left to right. So whatever is in my variable called degrees, it'll divide it by 260 first, then I'll multiply that by 2, then I'll multiply that times the, the value of pi here. Um, so, and I mean, that could even be a function call. So I could first take the log. This is the natural logarithm of a value x, and take, and then take the exponential. And since these are inverse of, of inverses of each other, you'll see that if you take the, the the natural log and take the exponential, you get the same result back, right? Um, okay, but um, on to you know adding new functions. So. So, so this is in general how you use functions in a library, and in this class we'll be using lots of libraries. You, you import the library or the module using the import statement, okay? But you can create your own functions um, and add them um, to the library here, or, or well, add them to the language, right? So the most basic way you create a function is you use the def keyword. Def is for defining a function or a function definition, right? So the, 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 there are three parts to every function, no matter what language you're using. Um, it's the name of the function, the parameters it takes as input. So, so you specify the parameters that come as input to the function between open and closed parentheses, which again is similar to C or Java, like you might be used to. Um, and then functions can, can return values. So most useful functions are value returning, but this function in this case doesn't actually return anything. So we'll get to value returning functions in a bit here. So and, and so this is defining a function here. So before you can use a function, you first have to define it. But once it's defined, so once I've executed the cell here, then I can I can invoke that function. So here to invoke a function, you just need to know the name of the function and what parameters it takes. Um, but here, yeah, our function doesn't take any parameters, so I, you still need the open and closing parentheses, but since it doesn't take any parameters, you don't pass in anything when you invoke it. But when you when you invoke a function, then it's as if I jump, do a jump, and then I start executing these lines of code. So the Python interpreter will jump here and, and execute. So since I just had two print statements, when I invoke the function, it will just, those two print statements um, will get executed. Okay. Um, and it, again, it's useful to be able to compose functions, right? So once you have defined a function, I could reuse it inside of other functions. So I could have a function called repeat lyrics that just calls the print lyrics function twice. And if I call that, I'm going to end up having you know this print statement happen twice. So I get my my lyrics out two times here. Um, okay. So um, I, I kind of already touched on this here, but but um, I mean this is true even if you're doing like writing a script and executing a script from a terminal or something like that. So so um, statements are executed sequentially. Um, by the interpreter in the order that they are um, in the order that they are encountered when the interpreter runs like a file or runs uh, a cell okay so if I have a cell like this it's going to execute these these instructions um, sequentially but in this case it's going to try to execute this instruction but I've never defined this function so as I already mentioned you first have to define the function before you can execute it so if I if I do this and again I'm just going to I'm going to go ahead and, and um, comment those out so you can see what happens. So if you do this, it'll actually throw an exception before it actually defines this function here. 
And the way I have it here, since since it throws it, it stops at this point, it never does the code after that sequentially. So it'll never define this function unless I move this function definition before trying to use the function here, right? So in general, for sequential execution, you have to have your definitions before the first time I try to use the function like this. And since that's that's all that's that's all the point that we're trying to make in this section here, right? Um, so most of the time when you um, have a function, um, it's going to be, it's going to need a couple of inputs, you know, so most functions that are useful need at least some input, if not, at least one thing, if not more things than one, right? So uh, one thing to notice, though, that I didn't mention is that, you know, we don't define, you know, we don't have to specify what the types are of these inputs, okay? So that allows for Python to have, if you know what polymorphism is in an object-oriented language, so because of that, because the, the types of, of variables are defined um, dynamically by when you call things, I mean, I, I can reuse this function by passing in variables or passing in values of different types, and, and, and this function will be fine, right? So I can pass in a string, and it'll just print out the string twice, because, you know, print knows how to handle strings if you pass in a string to it. But I can pass in an integer, and I'll, and I'll print that out twice, and I can pass in a floating point value, and so on, right? So this is actually an example of polymorphism, okay? But, but, but it, it comes, you, you can't do this in, in a language like C or Java uh, in a type, in a strongly typed language. But since types are, are uh, determined dynamically by the interpreter, it's perfectly fine to do that in Python like this, you know, so, so it doesn't really matter. As long as these print statements work with the type that I pass in, this function will work, even though I can pass in different kinds of types to it, all right? Um, variables and parameters are local to functions, so this is the same as other languages that, that you should be familiar with. Um, so if I define a variable like cat inside of a function, um, and if I call the function, cat is only, you know, defined inside of this function here, right? So th there's no, you know, so, so, so this cat variable was only valid while I was inside of my cat twice function. So if I try and print out, you know, if I try and access a variable named cat, um, there's, it's going to throw an exception here. So cat won't be defined, right? Okay, and then finally, um, I, um, I think I'll talk more about um, value returning functions later on here. Um, yeah, I'll talk a little bit more about those. But really, most functions, I mean, any function that, that's more than a trivial function is going to have some inputs like we've already talked about. So we'll have some parameters that come in as input but it will also return a value, all right? So, um, so here, I mean, it's still, my, my function doesn't actually return anything, so if you don't specify uh, the, the result, that, you know, the, the return value of a function, what you will get is that it, you'll see that, I mean, the functions do return something. They, they actually return, though, this none type or, or this uh, the, the, the special value of none, okay? So, so all functions return something, but if you don't specify what they return in Python, um, it returns just this none, okay? So later on, we'll see that, that you, can, you can define functions that actually return something, which is more useful. Those are known as value returning functions, okay? Or the author of Think Python called those fruitful functions. Um, so, so functions are extremely important to computational thinking, all right? So let me, I mean, just 
just highlight a couple of these things. So, I mean, one way that I can tell somebody who's more experienced than not is if they, they, if they really understand and use functions well, okay, in order to take a big problem, break it down into smaller pieces, right? So, so functions um, create a, a named group of statements, and that turns them into a chunk of computation. That, 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 that has lots of advantages. It makes it easier for you to... Uh, makes it easier for people to understand your code when you're chunking things like that, um, and and it makes it you know so you can reuse pieces of code more easily. <coughs> um, excuse me. That kind of reuse reduces uh, bugs um, in your when you're writing code. Um, So dividing a big program into functions allows you to debug um, things more easily. So it allows you to de debug small pieces before you start composing them together into bigger pieces. Um, and then, you know, finally, you know, well-defined functions might find uses outside of the, the where they started, right? So once you start building things that are more generically useful, you can abstract those out into modules and then reuse them into other programs and things like that, all right? Um, okay, so that's the basics of functions. Um, so back to some of the more fundamental things of, of, of any language, not just the Python language. So, um, Condition statements um, and, and Boolean expressions are part of, of any programming language. So uh, once again, the Python language is has operators and syntax pretty similar to what I'm assuming most people are already familiar with in other programming languages you might have used before Python. So in particular, you know we've we've got all the, the usual Boolean operators: less than, greater than, less than or equal. Um, and, and Python uses double equal to test for equality, um, which is the same as like in C and C++ and Java. So, you know, we can test for equality. Um, we can test whether things are not equal, so, so whether they're equal or, or not equal, and we can test, you know, less than or greater than. Um, and so on. Um, and so besides these kinds of, of um, Boolean operators, um, um, also like other languages, you can divide, you can combine um, Boolean operations into logical expressions. So, so the result of this, like, unlike, you know, like a numeric expression, we're, we're, we're building more complex expressions, but the result here is a, a true or false, so a yes or no answer, okay? Um, so, but um, Python uses and, or, and not, uh, you know, keywords instead of, um, um, so you might have, you know, if you use C, you might, you know, use double ampersand, double um, bar for or, or the exclamation point for not, right? Although nowadays in C++, C++ also defines and, keeps these, but also has and, or, and not, so... Uh, I can't remember for Java whether you have to use the, like the double ampersand or if, if they've added the and and the or. But but anyway, for, for for Python, it doesn't have the double ampersand. You have to use the keywords and or and not to combine logical expressions. So. Uh, but but yeah, so you can build up you know expressions like if you want to test whether something is greater than zero um, or less, if somewhere within the range from zero to 10 non-inclusive, so a number between 1 and 9, including 1 and 9. You can do an expression like that. Um, all right, so at that point, I mean, that allows us to then look at, like, conditional statements, like uh, if statements, and also loops uh, now. So now that we have, um, now that you know how to build uh, logical Boolean expressions, uh, we can build conditional statements, okay? So the basic syntax for an if statement um, looks like this. So you don't use parentheses. 
Um, oh, and the other thing, oh, and I forgot to mention this for the functions. Um, so the other thing is that, uh, so like, like the functions have a body for the function. Uh, if statements or while statements uh, have a body of code, a block of code that's associated with the if statement. So here, um, all blocks of code are defined by using indentation instead of curly braces in Python. So, so everything that's, that's indented four spaces after an if statement is the part that's, that's executed uh, conditionally if the, uh, if the expression is true. So here, yeah, so uh, since x is greater than 1 here, we're going to execute the print statement, right? And in this case, if it's not true that x is greater than 0, which is not anymore, uh, we, will, we won't execute the statements, right? And like I said, we use um, indentation, all right? And the indentation has to be equal. So if I have two spaces and four spaces, um, the, the code won't be able to be interpreted anymore. You'll get an indentation error. Okay? Uh, but it, it, it work, as long as the indentation is consistent, it works. So by default, we use four spaces. And you should stick to four spaces. But, but it just has to be um, consistent. So, but in this case, all three of these statements will be executed if the condition is true. So in this case, 5 is between 0 and 10, so it, it, it uh, executes, you know, it multiplies it by 3 and then prints it out here, right? Okay? Um, and so on. I'm probably going to go ahead and, and let you, you know, I'll move on. So there's an if-else statement, um, so you can do something if it's true, but if it's not true, you can do something else. Again, a standard part of most programming languages. Um, and there is no like switch case statement in Python. Uh, like in, in C and in Java have like, like a, a switch or a case statement. So if you do want to do like a chain conditional statement, you have to use a chain of if, else if statements. All right? So if you have more than two conditions, if you have three or more kind of conditions, you have to use if, else if, else if, else if the final else for your default um, statement here. Right? Um, and, and of course, if statements like loops and things can be nested as well. So here, my previous check to check whether x was greater than 0 or less than 10, I could have done it as two separate checks for the same result. Um, although this is kind of bad style, you should never do this when uh, you could instead use a... Um, this just adds complexity. So in general, when your code gets nested more than two or three levels, it becomes very hard to read. So you should prefer to use a Boolean expression rather than nesting of, of if statements. Right? You should try to remove nested if statements by, by doing a Boolean expression here. So. Um, all right, so those were condition statements. Our, our most basic uh, iteration statement, you know, for making loops is a while statement in Python. So we could construct a statement like starting with n is 10 and decrementing n one by one to count down from 10 to 0. Right? Um, So, I mean, you know, of course, you have to be careful if, if your loop doesn't end. So, so if you don't um, do something in order to make certain that this condition will eventually be false, so you break out of the loop, you end up with what's known as an infinite loop. So in this case, uh, it'll just keep running forever unless you stop your kernel there, right? So I won't scroll all the way down there, but, but you'll just get um, that going on forever there until you either stop your kernel or you run out of memory, basically. So, right? uh, it's not always easy to prove whether you will stop or not, so um, that was kind of an interesting digression in, in the Think Python book that, it, that we're reading here. This, this function is, is kind of a well. There's no known proof of that, that, that this will actually terminate for all values of n, this function here.
Um, okay, and, and there are break and continue statements that I won't go over here, but that um, you can use. So, so again, uh, these are used in the same ways in like, as like in C and Java. Um, so here's a more complex or more realistic example of iteration. So um, this is a new, what's known as Newton's method. So this is an example of an algorithm. So if you start with some initial guess of, um, of, of like a square root for a value A, uh, so if you start with an estimate X, so if, if A is like 4 and like you start with an estimate of, and you want to find this, the, the, the square root of, of A. If you start with an estimate of like 3, which is what we did here, if you just keep iterating this and, until y and x are equal, um, the, the end result will be the, the, the square root. So this calculates the square root, not through some sort of a formal method, but through a numerical method. This is what's known as an algorithm or a numerical method here. Right? Um, so, I mean, you know, it's obvious that this is correct for 4. So if, if four, we're trying to calculate the square root of 4, that's 2. But it, it works even for a more complex result. So, you know, the, 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 the square root of 13 is actually this value here to within precision of our machine here. So, um, Okay, so one final thing, or just a little bit more about functions. So back to functions again here. Um, so most useful functions uh, that, that you will write or that you will use from a library are going to return some value. Um, so we already use, I mean, a lot of the functions in math, of course, they return a single result. You know, so if I want the exponential of 1, um, um, it returns the result of what, what e raised to the power of 1 is, basically. Um, and, you know, if you want the sine of some value, uh, some some angle, um, it returns the sine, call math.sign, okay? Um, so the functions that we've written for ourselves up to this point in this lecture notebook don't actually, they're not fruitful functions by the author, by, by the ThinkPython author's um, uh, nomenclature here, all right? So, but, but of course, you can easily write value returning functions ourself. Uh, it, it's just, you just need the return keyword. So again, this is similar to other languages that I assume that you're familiar with. So, for example, if we want to have a function that return, calculates the area of a circle of a given radius, we can pass in radius as an input parameter. We can calculate the radius, which is pi r squared, uh, and then we can use the return keyword uh, to return our result, right? So the area of the circle, of the unit circle with a radius of 1 should be just pi, 3.141592, right? And the area of a circle with this radius um, is this, right? Um, so in the next video, we'll talk about how you return multiple values. Um, um, I'm, I'm sorry, um, I'm skipping ahead. So here, I mean, you can have multiple return statements in a function, right? Um, if you do this, make certain that all possible paths through your function will, will hit a return statement, right? So here, you know, the absolute value, we, we could implement it like this. So if it's less than zero, we'll just return the negative of the value, right? So that'll work. Uh, but here, you know, you have to be careful um, because... Um, we, we're checking if it's less than zero or greater than zero, but if it's exactly equal to zero that we pass in here, um, it doesn't hit either of these conditions and you end up getting re none return, okay? So for Python, probably that's not a big deal. Something that's expecting a numeric value and it gets none will just cause an exception to happen, right? But in a language like C, um, if you don't hit a return statement, you probably end up getting zero returned, um, often, or you could get garbage value returned, um, so that can cause bugs that, that are tougher to, to find if you don't um, if you don't hit you know an explicit return statement. So. Um,
So, so I mean, once again, I mean, you can. Um, use functions with inside in, inside of other functions. Okay, so that's the basics of, of decomposing a problem into functions using uh, what I like to call functional decomposition. Right. So you know, in order to, to to solve the problem of calculating the area of a circle, but in this in this case, um, we're given um, a def we're given a circle by giving two points: the center of the circle and the radius of the circle. So first. To calculate the area, we first have to figure out what the radius is by finding out the distance from the center to the, the point on the edge of the circle. Right? So we might do that by having by calling another function that can calculate the distance by by calculating the Euclidean distance between the center and, and between the two points that are given. All right? um, so functions that return a boolean result are very common. Um, so and, and you shouldn't you should never return zero and one in Python or actually in any language. I mean C doesn't really have built-in boolean, so you have to return one and zero. But if you're using a high-level language like C or Java, if you have functions that return boolean results, you should be returning a boolean type, right? So um, by convention, if we have functions that 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 are a boolean test you should use is something for that kind of a test so if i want to test if it is if it is divisible um, um, i can test it this way all right um all right and so i think i'm going to go ahead and, and um finish off here so one final thing um you know you got to Hopefully you've run across the concept of recursion. We might need to use re recursive functions a little bit in this class, right? So, um, I mean, recursion is fully supported in Python, like um, in, in most high-level languages, uh, or even in, in languages like C that, that you should be familiar with. Um, so you can always rewrite a recursive function as an iterative, iterative solution, right? So I might we might have done our previous while loop inside of a function to count down like using using this is what's known as iteration whenever you use a standard looping structure like a while or a for loop right um, but I, I could I could do that same thing recursively okay so recursive function is just um, if inside of the function I call the, the the function itself that's known as recursion okay so recursion Basically, in order to make recursion work, you have to have a base case um, and a general case. So the base case is w w when you get down to, to the problem that's that's trivial to solve, that you can solve it directly, that's the base case of your recursive function. So in this case, when we get down to zero, we're basically done with the recursion, so we just print blast off. Otherwise, we're not to the base case yet, so our general case for this function is we just print in and then call ourselves recursively on a smaller version of the function n minus one. All right, so I'd get the same result, but in a recursive way. All right. Um, so I'll skip over that. A, a common example of a recursive function is, is calculating the, re the factorial of, of a, a number. Right. So in this case, uh, recur recursive implementation of factorial, our base case is that zero factorial is one. So anytime you, you're asked to calculate the factorial zero, you just return one directly, right? So that's our trivial case. Otherwise, in factorial, you, you can compute by taking n times the factorial of n minus one, right? So this will allow us to uh, calculate any factorial in, in a recursive definition. Okay, so that's it for this notebook. So that's the basics, kind of real quickly, of uh, the syntax of Python and you know the basic control structures like like loops um, and condition statements and functions in Python. Right. So uh, if you need more information about that, you should go to the Think Python book or look at some of the other resources that I give in this class for learning more about the details of Python. Hopefully that's useful. Um, at this point, um, you know you should you should review Python.
Uh, and then when you're ready, go to the next video where we go into some of the more advanced kind of features of Python.